Get ready. You're about to experience the life science effect. The most influential players in the biotech, pharma, and medical device industries bringing you their insights and inspirational stories. Are you ready to boost your career? Ready to set your medical innovation in motion? You have arrived at the right place. Every week, another industry leader, more insights, more inspiration, and tips you can implement right away to make your mark on the world. And now, here's your host, life science veteran and senior leadership consultant, Steve Vinson. We're here today with Diana Caldwell. She's the CEO and the founder of Pearl Pathways. Uh, Diana, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Why don't you tell us about you and your company and what you do and all the volunteer stuff you do. And if you have time, uh, maybe talk about your personal life a little bit. Great. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you this morning. Um, I have been in the life science industry since 1990. And I've had a very interesting uh, career of opportunities and challenges and uh, growth personally as a leader. So I started uh, my career at Eli Lilly and Company. I actually did an internship for them for their device side of the business. Chose when I got a full-time offer to come into the pharmaceutical side and had a fantastic 15-year career there in uh, general management roles, sales, marketing, finance, operations. Um, and then about 12 years ago, made the decision that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Many folks might say, what? After 15 years in corporate America? And that's when I began on the path uh, to co-found Pearl Pathways about uh, eight, eight and a half years ago. Um, Gretchen Boker's my co-founder, and she's a, a protein chemist on the science side of the ha house. And so we're a great combination of, of business and science to, to build a life science consulting firm. So... Uh, our company helps accelerate drug and device development. That's what we're focused on. Our our vision is all about the patient. And the patient is waiting. And both Gretchen and I knew in our big corporation roles that there had to be a more nimble, better way to accelerate drug and device development. So uh, we're a consulting firm. We do all things regulatory. So we get drugs and devices approved. We uh, have a division of uh, QAQC, quality assurance, that helps make sure that folks are doing things compliantly in the right way and following all the regulations. We have a, a niche boutique clinical CRO, where we do small-scale clinical trials for devices and, and first in human on the drug side. And we have an IRB, which a lot of people don't know what that is, but that's an important uh, role that we serve human subjects and patients with in protecting them as they participate in clinical trials. So that is a, a little different part of our business, uh, much more highly regulated and regimen than a sort of boutique consulting in the rest of the house. So that's a little bit about Pearl. On the, the personal uh, front, I'm really passionate about the Indiana life science community. I'm really proud to serve on the Indiana Health Industry Forum's board of directors as well. I've recently been asked to join the Kelly Life Sciences Advisory Board for uh, the great work they do in life sciences and uh, a conference series. And I'm a uh, double dipper from IU. So both my undergrad and my MBA are from IU. So it's neat to be working with that organization. Um, I also serve in the ARC Foundation uh, Board and uh, they serve... Um, adults and children with uh, disabilities. And I have uh, my middle child uh, has some disabilities. And so that's a really great personal passion for me. And I serve in some other university boards and others trying to give back to the community. And kind of what I'm recently really into is making sure I can also get better looped into young female entrepreneurs to see how I can help them since I'm now eight years in and we don't get to call ourselves a startup anymore. Yeah, good point. Yes. <laughs> good yeah. Point. So that's a little bit about Pearl Pathways, um, what I, I did earlier in my career and, and where I like to give my time when I'm not working. Great. You, um, so your bachelor's psychology, correct? Yeah. In marketing MBA? Yes, double HR and marketing, but yes. Now, um, we started our careers around the same time. Uh and I chose life sciences because that's where I was able to get a job, but then I fell in love with it and um, continued. So 
Did you choose life sciences? Did it choose you? But obviously you've stayed with it. So you've chosen it over the years. I have. I've decided to stay there. Yes. And why? Great. So, you know, I um, was really lucky and had an internship in undergrad at the State Board of Health, Mm. working when Woodrow Myers, Woody Myers was uh, head of the State Board of Health. And that's where I caught the healthcare bug. Mm. Um, and look, and I was looking at it from a policy standpoint. And actually through the, the guidance and leadership of him and mentorship of, of people I work with there, I had considered going into an MPA path, Masters of Public, rather than uh, uh, an MBA. And um, I remember the quote that Woody Meyer said to me is, get an MBA, the private sector will always take you. <laughs> but without the MBA, the the private sector might not take you. Uh, so that smart. was a, a, a inspirational. <laughs> but so when I began to look for uh, jobs after school, I kept getting pulled into and attracted to life science opportunities. Mm. High tech also, but uh, I really was intrigued with uh, the good work that we get to do because of the industry we work in. Yeah. So you, so you get the high tech excitement. And you know that you're making a difference. That's right. And, and I think everyone can make a difference in any industry. But boy, this one is really tailor made for those of us that that want to care and serve. And, and that's right. And it's an it? awesome yeah. responsibility. Also, yeah. it, it, we get to do good, but also we have to remember that the work we're doing, the patient's waiting. So you mentioned the and you mentioned the institutional review board part, the IRB. And um, I'm reminded uh, on a previous episode, I was talking with. Deborah Pollock Millgate and I had just gone. I don't know if you were there. I, don't, I didn't see you, but the they were talking about the GDPR. Yes, I was there. You were there. Okay, good. Yes. Um, she and I talked right after um, and and did an episode. And but what struck me was when Kristen Eilenberg was talking about look for clinical trials. If you're complying with FDA regulations and you're following what the IRBs have told you to be doing and and all of that stuff, she said the patients. Uh, the patient is first anyway. And like you said, the patients are waiting and let's protect their privacy while we're at it. And, and so I, once she said that, I was, I calmed down. I was, I was getting pretty, pretty nervous. But then once she said that, I said, you know what? She's right. Anyway. Right. Um, does that, by the way, does that change anything with, with your business? The, the, uh, for listeners that don't know the general data protection regulation. <laughs> yes, it's EU a European. Yeah, it's an EU yeah. European. You know, I think we're all just beginning to understand both from a, a marketing and sales list. Mm-hmm. We have financial accounting list. Mm. Uh, we do serve globally, so we have to be cognizant of of regulations, not just in the U.S. but the EU. Mm-hmm. But of course, because we're involved in clinical trials, yeah, and uh, have uh, practitioners, physicians contact information as well as patients at times we're at sites and in, mm-hmm. in, in contact with mm-hmm. patients uh we are uh, needing to, to ensure that we examine our business processes and practices and take a look at this and we've already done that on on a couple fronts and in, in a few areas but we're going to learn along the way too yeah yeah i i would expect your company to to maybe be at the forefront of some of that obviously we're all learning but with your business i think you'll you'll probably be learning faster than the rest of us so Everybody call Pearl Pathways if you need help. Ah, well, thank you. Yes. <laughs> There's your plug, right? <laughs> yes. I, I accidentally plugged you in the last episode too, by the way. Oh, well, Because we were talking about. I'll take any, any plugs we can get. We yeah. were talking about calling an IP attorney early on in your process. And I said, uh, why are people hesitant to do that? I mean, you wouldn't hesitate to call like uh, Pearl Pathways to help with yeah. the regulatory stuff. So anyway, uh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you so, <laughs> so much. So uh, back on the leadership talk, we started to uh, get into it and I had to hurry up and hit record before we said something interesting. Um, when you're looking for leaders and you're growing your company or you're looking to bring somebody on to help you out, um, what do you look for? What are the characteristics of, of the leaders you're looking for? That's a great question. And I've had the, the, the wonderful fortune of working with fabulous leaders throughout my career, both at Eli Lane Company and, and elsewhere. You know, I to me, integrity um, doing what you say and saying what you mean is really important. Um, alongside that is uh, transparency and openness, an openness to, to change and listen and, and hear others, but also be transparent in what you stand for and, and what, what's important to you. Um, you have to know your stuff, particularly in technical industries like ours. I'm not saying you have to know all the technical intricacies, but you do need to have 
a credible knowledge base and be a, a steward of learning to learn about your area and, and ensure that those around you are learning. So you do have to have the, st- the, the good stuff of, of uh, technical competency in your field yeah. so that people will lead you. Um, and then there's some of that softer stuff, right? It's You have to be inspiring. You have to model, mm. not just ask others to do it, but be willing to model it yourself, to be passionate in what you're doing. At least for me, that's really important. And mm-hmm. so... You know, I think the modeling is really important, whether if you're hoping your whole company will pitch in and take out the trash or recycling, then you have to be willing to do it yourself all the way to taking high risk, maybe having crucial conversations with clients Mm. or with other colleagues. And if you're not willing to have that open, crucial, transparent conversation, then how can others do that? So I think the modeling piece can't be understated. Great. Do you have a story about a project that went particularly well and... What was your, what, what characteristics of your leadership actually do you think contributed to the success of that project? Well, it's a little more than probably a project. It was about a couple, two, three years of my life. But, um, when I was in my twenties, I was, uh, named to be the uh, district sales manager for a Florida district in Orlando, Florida. And, um, that was my first manager job, first real official leadership role, uh, big, big group, 15 of us. And those were big districts back then. And, um, they weren't doing well. They were 78th out of 80th in the nation in terms of, of ranking. Wow. So that was an incredible journey and experience, uh, for me to begin to learn my leadership as I was also doing a turnaround Mm -hmm. essentially. So, uh, I asked a lot of questions and a lot of help from the good leaders and senior folks that are already in the district. Mm -hmm. And, of course, surround myself with great season directors and district sales managers that can help coach and develop me as well. Yeah. And uh, I also leaned heavily on HR because I did have uh, quite a few performance issues or performance corrections that needed to occur. And so that took a lot of intestinal fortitude. And I want to make sure I was doing the right thing for the people. And but of course, for the per the company policy also. So an incredible growth opportunity. Yeah. For me, so you're in your in my career. You were in your 20s. Were there people older than you, more mm-hmm. experienced than you, that you had to have one of those corrective interviews with? Oh yes. Yeah. How did yeah. that go? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, if you if you focus on the problem and issue, and you treat people right, and you're transparent and open, you can usually get through any conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and Lily's a great company, so they certainly have good models for improving performance or addressing issues mm-hmm. um, and really helping understand the situation from both parties perspective to understand that, is it a skill gap? Is it a will gap? Is there something else going on? And so a great, great background, I think of Lily's integrity and approach yeah. helps with all those, but some of those conversations people don't want to participate in and, mm. and challenges and they want to keep doing things the way they've been doing them. And it's, it's difficult. Change is hard. I remember when, when I started in the early nineties, I used to wonder, cause I was surrounded. I also started at Lilly in, in Lafayette and at Tippecanoe. And I was surrounded by these people who had been doing this for 15, 20 years. And I was in a position of responsibility that said, sometimes I had to challenge them. I always wondered what that would be like to be, a person with that much experience. And I thought, boy, they must not like it. And I would, I had all these stories I told myself in my head. Turns out they're not true because now I'm those people. Exactly. I'm working with people in their twenties who, uh, I need to listen to. Right. And so I, I've just, I've learned that everybody has their story. Everybody has something to contribute and I don't mind it. I don't mind these twenties, mid twenties people, uh, giving me, correcting me on stuff. So I guess that's my message to our younger listeners is, you know, you have your story, you have your contribution, uh, do it as Diana says, professionally, if you're using a process, that's even better. Uh, so that's great. That's a great story. I, I think like that. all throughout our stage of our career, we change and grow. Um, and our authentic self, which you hear a lot about right now changes mm-hmm. over time. But I, I do think realizing that, what you have to offer at each phase of your career is important. You're impatient when you're younger, of course. You don't have as much experience to draw from, but boy, you've got passion and creativity and yeah. and drive that that isn't yet seasoned for those of us a little later in our careers. And so I True. completely agree with you that I'm energized by 
the young startup entrepreneurs that we work with. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a lot of millennials, but we do have one in the company and we work with a lot of millennials and other, other uh, facets of our business. And I, I think it's very, very exciting. You know, the, the word millennials really you know, used a lot now and too often in a pejorative sense. Yes. But what I've seen, uh, and I was talking to my daughter who is on, she's 13, so we can't figure out if she's a millennial or what I'm starting to call social native or social network native or whatever. I don't know what the next, <laughs> I don't know what the, the next, next one, one called. I don't know what they're going to call it. Well, my theory is it'll be something to do with social networking because a lot of millennials didn't grow up with social networking because it didn't come along until 09 or 10. So, but my 13 year old doesn't know a world without Instagram and all that stuff. Um, but you know, I think, and I, I'm borrowing from something I heard from, I don't know where, but I think mo the millennials that we talk about, man, do they care deeply and mm -hmm. they, and they don't want to sit around and wait for change to happen. So you talk about change being hard. They're not afraid to say, we need to change because we're not, say, serving the patient in a good way. That's right. And so, and we need to change now. I'm not ready to wait. I'm not going to be timid and sit back. And I just love that energy. I just love it. And so if, if we have millennials listening, I'm on your side. So Me too. What about a project that didn't go or, or a situation that wasn't going well, either in your, your, uh, professional part or your, your volunteer work or whatever, looking for a lesson here that you've applied? Cause one of the things I talk about is, is failure is, you know, failure's gotten a bad rap. We all need to fail because mm -hmm. that's how we learn, right? So do you have a story about a time that maybe didn't go the way you wanted? <laughs> I have many. Um, I think one I'd like to highlight because I think it's so important in life sciences and particularly startups that we're trying to support m over half our businesses with pre-commercialization startups, virtual young companies. And, and that's the lifeblood of the industry in terms of innovation. And they're never going to probably make it all the way like an Amgen or Genentech did in this day and age. But mm -hmm. the way they work with the industry is so important. But I think that the balance between the science and the business is so important in life sciences. We are technically driven and we have to respect and be awestruck by the amazing innovation that we have. But we also have to, there's many great science ideas that have never gone anywhere mm -hmm. in a startup or elsewhere, even in a big pharma company, because other things got in the way. In some cases, it's uh, poor uh, financing and business planning. And other times, maybe it's uh, that we weren't willing to transparently look at the data because it was tied to somebody's baby and they politically drove it through a company. And we've all seen that happen in big companies too. So um, one of the stories is I was working in Latin America as the, uh, the regional marketing head for osteoporosis business unit. And so uh, I was traveling across all of Latin America during a launch mode and I was partnering with medical uh, to get a a uh, article, a critical article translated, and uh, there's a method by which you can get English publications translated and then republished in Latin America journals. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, the affiliates in those the region are they need resources. They need respect respectful science and things to be able to communicate. And while many physicians are uh, competent in in English in Latin America, it's a lot better to have something in their native tongue. So we were working on that project, small, fairly small tactic in the realm of all the other things that we were doing. And we had a snafu breakdown on the uh, version of translation and uh, was working with a native speaker physician that, that was there. And, and he and I were working closely together and and uh, the uh, translation version that should have gone didn't go and didn't get QC checked. And so we had a snafu and published a lot of of the wrong version. Uh. So you think, well, that's kind of small, but it's not because from a leadership standpoint, one of the things that I learned is it doesn't matter what happened along the way. I had to completely own it and be the leader and deliver the tough message and not blame it on anybody else. And, and I, there were many people in there I could have said, cause there, we did an after action review to say what happened. And, mm -hmm. but ultimately it, it, if it doesn't matter, you have to own it and you have to be committed to the outcome and work effectively across an organization. And at, at the end of the day, if something messes up, you got to own it. Yeah, absolutely uh, agree with that. And ownership doesn't mean blaming yourself, at least the way I see it. Um, it means 
you own it and you're going to also own the, what are we going to learn from this? Right. Yes. And then the solution, how do we move forward? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. That's a good one. Is there anything that you wanted to tell me, but I didn't ask the right question? Well, we didn't get to talk too much about the life science talent here in Indiana mm, absolutely. and where we're headed as a state. And I recently wrote an op-ed piece in the Biofutures magazine about our trends and growth of jobs and that we need to be a net, net importer of life science talent. Mm, mm. And I'm really encouraged because I think that we're working across the industry and the not-for-profit world as well as the larger players to begin to wrestle with this. But I, I just want to keep that up to the forefront because we do need great talent here at all levels. And one gap we know we have, everyone talks about the money. We don't have enough investors. We don't have enough VC. They fly over us, but we also don't have enough serial entrepreneurs hmm. and bold leaders that are willing to take the risk and chance to, is, to lead startups. What does it take for somebody to, to do that? So you, you jumped out on your own, took the risk and were successful. So what, what was in you that caused you to want to do that? So if we want to import those people or we want to make them here, right. how do we do that? What is, what is it that we're looking for in people? Oh, I wish I had the secret, but I, <laughs> but I think that an ecosystem and role models and others that people can see that have done it before and been successful mm -hmm. is really important. Yeah. So the work that they're doing at our incubators, uh, Launch Indy, Launch Fishers, uh, The Hatch, all these organizations that allow folks to get networked and see role models and mentors is important. Mm -hmm. It's soft stuff, but boy, that is important. Um, and I think money, financial backing, and not everybody's at the point in their career that they can maybe not get a salary for six to 12 months, mm -hmm. let alone invest and write checks yeah. into a company. Yeah. So having creative financing strategies or funds, seed fund available so that maybe a risk taking CEO can get a little bit of funding for a salary and some other development work while they're getting fundraising done, mm -hmm. um, help and coaching on how you, how you network and, and raise the money from seed funding, friends and family angels all the way up to VC money, I think it's important. So it's role models, it's some systems in place, it's access to training and modeling and uh, of all the key things you need to do. And I think uh, the Purdue Foundry with their Foundry X program is doing a great job there because mm -hmm. they're putting a infrastructure and some training and access to seasoned um, leaders in, in the organization. And I think we have a great opportunity with a lot of these Lily folk that just retired out to uh, get some fantastic scientific and business leadership. I think the challenge is they've grown up in an organization that's very risk averse. Yeah. And, and let's be really open here. Um, big corporate America does not necessarily right. breed risk taking right. entrepreneurs. They can't afford that risk tolerance that our startups can. Mm -hmm. So um, adjusting to that may take a little bit and they may not always be willing to jump in to do that. However, I've just recently had some coffee chats with some folks that are ready to do that and they're, and they're, they need, but they need help on they where support. to begin yeah. because they think they're going to be surrounded by a whole development team of people and right. have to figure out how to work in a virtual environment and fundraise and all that great stuff. Some of my biggest uh, horror stories, if anybody asked me, like, tell me a horror story, were the few years after I left Lilly and went to a small company and thought, I'm going to have all this support, right? Absolutely. It wasn't there. So I was thinking about those those folks that just left Lilly uh, in our area. And you're absolutely right. They have so much experience, but they're all looking for job. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them are like looking for another job or maybe they're fully retired. But boy, they would be ideal, wouldn't they? At least to team up with somebody and be part of a startup. That absolutely. Would be great. I remember when I left Lilly, uh, one of my good friends walked up and said, oh, that, it's great. And I was telling him about what I was doing and said, how big is your team? Right? Because at Lilly, it's like there was a yeah. lot of of uh, respect depending on how big your team was. Yeah. And I looked to my left physically and looked to my right and I said, oh, you're looking at her. Yeah. There, there's no big team. Yeah. So, nice. Uh, Love it. <laughs> oh, thank you for bringing that up. That's so important. Well, that's a good note to take a break on when we come back. We'll do the rapid fire round. Love it. We are very proud to have the support of the Indiana Health Industry Forum here at the Life Science Effect. They have been with us since day one. IHIF provides guidance and leadership on public policy issues that contribute to innovation in the health science sector 
deliver therapies to patients in need, and further the development and growth of their member companies. IHIF also works with the government and other groups to support specific initiatives and legislation. Also, if you need a connection in the health industry, give them a call. Go to IHIF.org and they will hook you up. They have been a tremendous supporter of ours, so thanks again to the Indiana Health Industry Forum. Go check out IHIF.org and support them like they support our life science community. Now, back to the show. Diana, are you ready for the rapid fire round? I'm ready. Excellent. Finish this sentence. The one principle I will never compromise is... Integrity. What is one thing every aspiring leader should stop doing today? Blaming others. What's one thing every aspiring leader should start doing today? Take more time to truly connect with people. And tell me about a book you've read or are reading. Well, a little of a story, and then I'll tell you about the book. So uh, I'm in a CEO group, and we had the great fortune to go up to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and go through some leadership development at the Zingerman's facility. Zingerman's is a, a fantastic uh, chain of bakery and uh, restaurants there in the Ann Arbor area, and they're kind of legendary for their service and what they've done and how successful they've been. So we got to chat with Ari Wines, Winesweek, I believe is his last name, who's one of the co-founders. And he wrote a book about building a great business. And I bought it and he signed it when I was there. And about oh, two months ago, I got it out and I'm, I'm going through it. And they talk about their culture, their visioning process, and how they've built a great business. Mm, that's fantastic. Yeah. Now I want to read that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one last thing, and, and, uh, and we'll get you out of here because, oh, it's 1015, so really fast. Um, if you could just take a minute to tell us about your activities um, around women and leadership. And uh, you mentioned a little bit of it early on and women uh, entrepreneurs and things like that. Could yeah. you just give a plug for what you're working on? Right. It is an interesting time right now um, for women in all kinds of roles. And I think in Indiana, we're poised to maybe change the trends we've seen of C-suite and women business owners that scale. We have a lot of women businesses in our state and across the country, but they still continue to scale at a, at a slower pace mm. than many others. Um, I had the great fortune of being part of the Goldman Sachs uh, executive education program, the 10,000 small business program about a year and a half ago. And I went to a reunion recently in February alongside around 2000 other small business owners. And uh, we heard a lot of great talks about the challenge of small business owners and heard from a lot of great female entrepreneurs. Um, so I think the time is right for uh, for women in leadership and, and female entrepreneurs to ask for help, be willing to learn, and uh, take some risk. Um, I really uh, am following closely and like some of the work organizations like Startup Ladies is doing. And uh, I'm really encouraged to see some of the angel investors and even VC funds begin to to work harder to look for women to invest in. And the Goldman Sachs program, it was clear to me, worked hard to get a 50-50% representation in the program. Great. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a great next decade or two for for uh, women in business. I serve right now on the WeBank uh, Certification Committee, which is a, a Midwest certifying body for WeBank women-owned certified businesses. I get to work yeah. with them and I get to look at a bunch of women-owned businesses right here in our own state that I can either silently, but if I can anyway, help support them. Absolutely. That's great. So always Thank support you. Indiana businesses and support uh, diverse businesses if you can. Absolutely agree. Uh, how can people reach you if they want to connect or learn more about your business? Yeah. Anytime. LinkedIn is probably one of the best ways. Please, if you hear this, just shoot me a, a LinkedIn invite. To say you heard the great podcast that we did and uh, I'll, I'll LinkedIn. You can also reach me at dcaldwell at pearlpathways.com. My email address and uh or in any way, uh, you can always just call contact at Pearl Pathways and get to me there. Perfect. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really Thank appreciate you. it. It's been fun. You have just experienced the life science effect. Who else needs to be inspired? Tell your friends, tell your colleagues, tell your boss. 
It'll make you sound smarter, and it might even get you that big raise. Thanks to our presenting sponsor, BPM Associates, helping life science companies design, manage, and execute their most complex projects. Check them out at bpm-associates.com. Thank you for listening. Go to the lifescienceeffect.com website for show notes and great links. That's all for today. Now go do something amazing.